Characters on time. <laughs> okay, we'll what? just continue. Uh, in the comments, Wally wrote, Melanie, your characters on Seinfeld and Rugrats, love it. Thanks for the joy and laughs you brought me. And Deb wrote, hi, so nice to see you. So, amazing actor. So, um, and on that, uh, we will uh, get started. So uh, welcome tonight uh, to this uh, program, a conversation with Melanie Chartoff, Odd Woman Out. I am Phil Pajali, a librarian with the Yonkers Public Library. Um, and uh, we are very excited to have with us tonight, uh, Melanie Chartoff uh, to do this program. And um, I would like to also uh, thank the Friends of Crestwood Library um, for making uh, this program possible. So um, Melanie Chartoff, uh, if you're not already familiar with her, um, is from originally from New Haven, Connecticut. Um, she earned her BA at Adelphi University. She trained with the very famous uh, acting teacher, Stella Adler. And from there, she went on to a long career um, on Broadway, uh, off Broadway, doing stand up comedy, doing improv. Uh, she appeared for two years, 1980, 1982, on the live comedy show Fridays on ABC. Um, which co-starred uh, Michael Richards. And um, from 1991 to about 2005, she did the voice of Dee Dee Pickles on Rugrats. And um, chances are you've seen her uh, in many of her uh, guest appearances on television shows as varied as uh, Seinfeld, Newhart, Wise Guy, St. Elsewhere, and Desperate Housewives. Um, so she has a book out uh, that was published this year. It's called Odd Woman Out, Exposure in Essays and Stories. You just take these papers out of it. Okay, but this is what it looks like. All right, so we're gonna be uh, talking about the book tonight with Melanie. So uh, welcome, Melanie. Thank you, Phil. Nice to be here in Yonkers. I lived in New York for a long time and occasionally foraged through Yonkers. <laughs> I've never been to your library until tonight, though. Yeah, so the, the Crestwood Library, I should mention, is one of three Yonkers public libraries. Um, uh, we are the smallest branch, but we are uh, very friendly like the other branches. So um, the first question I'd like to ask you, Melanie, is uh, this book originated uh, in several essays published uh, in a variety of journals and magazines. Um, what led you to begin writing about your life and how did these essays become a book? Well, I've been uh, carrying this information and, and thinking, you know, whenever things were slow, I think, well, I'm having a pretty remarkable life so far, at least it's interesting to me. Uh, where I, at the end of the 20th century, I was a working actor in all all forms that were available at that time. I was uh, working on stage, I was doing voiceover, I was doing occasional television, and uh, I felt very fortunate. I wasn't a big star, I wasn't the biggest player, but I was part of it all. And uh, since I was a little kid, I had been wanting to be in theater and uh, started at Yale University and Long Wharf Theater in my hometown. Uh, in Three Penny Opera at Yale, which is an amazingly magnificent, expensive production. I thought it would always be like that. Yale is so well funded, you know. And then Long Wharf Theater, I was in the children's company there and, and was able to watch incredible actors pass through on their way to different venues in New York and such. And that was my dream, to be a working actor, to make a living at it. And um, I began to make a living at it pretty early on. I um, got to New York and I was very fortunate to get my first Broadway show within a few weeks of working in New York as a production assistant in commercials. And I had an audition during lunch hour and it was like I had a secret lover. I had to sneak off during lunch and sneak back on the bus and go into this audition where there were a million people, it seemed, competing, you know, dancers sweating and stretching in the hall and singers trilling in the hallways. 
And then it was my turn to come up and they had me do some crazy choreography and improvise a routine and, and read some, uh, uh, sing some lines and, and work with the piano player to sing some other lines, which I sensed were rock and roll, uh, which wasn't my metier. I was studying opera and ballet and I was studying with Stella Adler as very classically trained. And then my agent called me a couple of days later and said, you got the part. I said, wonderful, when do I start? And he said, they want you there now. So I had to walk out of a production job, which was paying me a fortune, $160 a week. I had a desk, I had a place to be every day. And I got the part and I walked away. I, my name was Mud and Commercials in, in New York after that. Uh, I had burned a bridge, but I had another bridge in front of me, being on Broadway. And um, unlike the classical training that I had in Shakespeare and Moliere and such, this was uh, a musical written by Galt McDermott who had written Hair and composed it and directed by Peter Hall, soon to become Sir Peter Hall of the National Theater and all these British designers. And it was a sci-fi rock opera. And uh, this had never been done on Broadway before opera, let alone, I mean, Porting and Best was done on Broadway, but very few rock operas uh, besides Hair uh, and Dude, which has, had bombed that very year, 1972. So here it was on the vanguard of something incredible. And um, Peter Hall showed us all the stage the first day and had trampolines inset in it to resemble craters on another planet from which we performers would leap as if weightless from crater to crater. I mean, it was brilliant, we thought. And um, the music was wonderful. And I played two different roles. In my first scenes, I played a blue character on the controlled planet Earth where everybody wore control hats so they wouldn't have any individualistic feelings. And I had a love scene with Raul Julia with whom I was in love from the first moment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the next scene, I was painted yellow so that I looked green as a geologist on this radical planet called Ithaca. And on this Ithacan planet, we were all rebels who didn't want to have our heads controlled and we didn't want to be blue like everybody else. Well, our queen um, was married to the king of our planet, who is a brilliant man who is now just a brain in a robot that went around the stage. And um, he told her she, she needed to mate with an earthling so that we could begin to breathe a new genetic pool of free people. So she seduced Raul Julia, who was a garbage dumper on our Ithacan planet. We had become a dump. This was so prophetic. It was sort of like what they want to do to the moon, right? <laughs> and uh, so we, we seduced him down to our planet and she was going to mate with him to have, you know, fresh babies of a new hue. And um, during this, we knew that the Earthlings were going to come and get Raul. They wanted their spaceship back, which was like an old Model T Ford dump truck. It was brilliant, brilliant, I'm telling you. And then uh, the music was great. And there were all these like stagecraft things, aside from the trampolines. We were building all during the show, this spaceship that was going to take us off to New Jerusalem, a new planet far out of the reaches of Earth, evil Earth. So um, the final preview before we opened for a big crowd, uh, we had a full orchestra for the first time playing the orchestrations, which were very space age. And we had the full cast and we had all the backers in the audience and all the producers were there. And we were singing to the score for the first time. And at the end of the show, we're to climb into this spaceship that we've been creating, which was like a fire escape staircase going into this enormous tail of a, a rocket ship with enormous sound effects and smoke coming out of it. I mean, it was thrilling. So on this last preview night, we dutifully, all 40 of us, started to climb this, this staircase singing, New Jerusalem Will Rise. And um, we're halfway up and I noticed dust is coming uh, from the ceiling and think, well, there's a new effect. We didn't rehearse that yet. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I heard a creaking sound and the staircase sort of slanted. And the kids at the top were screaming and the people at the bottom were yelling. And then slowly, it began to descend faster and faster. I mean, it felt like time stood still because we were dropping about two stories. And um, my life got very clear to me at that very moment. It was astounding how clear everything was. It was like, oh, I'm going to die, but at least I made it to Broadway. <laughs> and so then we crashed through a trampoline into the bowels of the stage. And I went, I blacked out. A lot of people did, we went unconscious. And then I felt a white light on me 
And I felt like, oh, I'm going to heaven. This is just the way they describe it. And it was actually stage lights, you know, which is my idea of heaven pouring in. And then all the crew were coming in to bail us out. Only a few people were really injured and they were taken to the hospital. Um, I just had bruised hands. But I'll read a little bit from the chapter called Road to the Stars about uh, what it was like after that. Um, ambulances arrived to take the injured to the hospital. Aside from bruised palms and heels, I was fine, but many left in pain and shock that night. The remaining company mutinied. We all walked out and we all called our agents. Nobody's taking responsibility, said my agent. It's an act of God, they're saying. Speculation was that the winches had pulled loose from the concrete reinforced ceiling of the brand new Broadway theater called the Eurus, that the designer's calculations had been inaccurate. My agent told me that in accepting hazard pay in my contract and in having no serious injuries, I was obliged, legally contracted to go on with the show and not to disclose the nature of our accident. The secret was very hard to keep. And after a brief delay, the show would go on despite evidence to the contrary. Most of us in the small parts were told the same, take it and go on with the show or leave it in breach of your contract. The Broadway theater had proven very inhumane in this, my first show. So we opened and we only ran three nights, all of which were sold out because everybody had heard about this debacle on Broadway <laughs> and they wanted to see the spectacular effects and the incredible music and see Raul, uh, who was wonderful in the show, despite it all. Um, but we closed in about three nights. And on the way home on the bus, back to my little apartment that night, no longer a Broadway actress, I thought to myself, my character became very clear to me last week. It, it was clear to me that I had no real life. All I had was an, act, an actor's life. And if I, I felt like life was enough because I died on Broadway, what was I gonna do about having a real life? So from that point on, I started to think about I'm a human being, not just an actor, and I need to find like a real human life. That's a lot of what my book is about. Aside from being a successful actor, who was I as a person when I wasn't playing other women? Well, in the, in the chapter, The Crossroads, which I think is, is one of the pivotal chapters in the book, you describe leaving a job at Sears at age 16 uh, in defiance of your father's wishes um, to pursue an acting career. And it's interesting, on, I'm gonna just go to the page now. Um, so what you write here is at breakfast, my father hadn't even mentioned the director. Now I was really, really mad. He'd say I had no right to be mad, but I was, oh, I was. Wasn't it my right to know I had a job offer, an acting job offer? This was my real feeling, not a pretend feeling like he preferred. Wasn't it my right to be furious? My enormous feelings would be welcome in the theater, but not at home. I did not want to pretend I wasn't upset like so many other times when I made like everything was okay, lumping my throat, burning my stomach. I wanted a life in the theater where my enormous feelings would be welcome as they were not welcome at home. So my question is, do you think a lot of actors go into the profession to express things that are held back at home or in their family or among friends? And do, do you find acting to be what you had hoped for in that sense? Well, no, you know, it's not therapy. Uh, you're given a prescribed series of lines and you have to, you know, create a, a soul and a human being that aligns with that particular story. You just can't let off your own personal feelings. Um, but I found in the workshops and the improvs and the acting classes, I could tap into a lot of my emotional power and know that it was there if it were ever needed, you know, in a role. But no, a lot of people go into acting with the misconception that it's like um, therapy, primal therapy, <laughs> you know, where you're just going to get all your feelings out. Therapy is the right place to get all your enormous feelings out. Uh, there's not much room for your primal feel feelings unless you're in a story that requests them. Um, I don't recall in the book you going into this in detail, so I wanted to ask um, about your experience training as an actor with Stella Adler. Could you talk more about that? Mm -hmm. Well, she was tough. Uh, it took me about a year to get into her classes. It was a very competitive atmosphere in New York at the time. 
Harvey Keitel was in my class, John Savage was in my class, some really extraordinary actors like a young Mark Ruffalo was with Stella at that time. And she could be really tough. I mean, eviscerating. There is a video of her coaching me actually on YouTube. I think it says Stella Adler coaches Melanie or something like that. And she reads the audience or the, the, the audience of students a riot act because they're not familiar with the play I'm enacting. She says, you don't understand comedy. You don't understand what this play is about. She's leaving the theater. I mean, she was like so dramatic about it. Stella really showed you the size of a personality, a theatrical personality. And um, she also showed you how cruel the theater could be. I wasn't ready to listen to that. I thought it'd be a kind and welcoming family. And it, it wasn't always that. Um, but I loved working with her and I worked very hard to keep her approval. I got approved of in the scene that I performed that's on YouTube, but it wasn't always that way. And she could be especially tough on the women. But I saw her rip apart Mark Ruffalo one night because he came in to do a Shakespearean Lord and he wore a dress. Now, I think he just had that at home and it felt like the robe that the character would wear. And she read him the riot act about that. And I thought, yeah, that should be so minor. To me, it felt like it was such a minor thing that he's trying to get into the feel of the period by wearing that long skirt. Um, but it seemed off the mark. But she said what we had to do as actors was support the story. Anything to do with our own personalities or our own uh, jokes or our own wish list was not appropriate. If it wasn't appropriate to the story, it did not belong on the stage. Um, she was a real stickler for honoring the playwright's intention. And uh, she wrote a book about Chekhov, actually. She wrote a book about Ibsen. She wrote a book about many of the great playwrights, talking about how behaviors were different in that, par in that period, uh, how behaviors were circumscribed uh, by the economy of the times. Uh, she was a very brilliant and resourceful teacher. Uh, she could really take you into history, um, you know, and wanted you to do the plays faithful, not an update, but faithful to the period in which they were written. So it was like a sociology and anthropology class as well as an acting class. Um, in the chapter, The Empty Space, you describe a meeting with the director, uh, Peter Brook. Yeah. Um, when Ben Kingsley introduces you to him. Um, and in the moment that you meet him, um, and you look at each other, there seems to be a connection there. And you describe um, an empty space uh, where uh, you can go as an actor, where you kind of forget this negativity that was in uh, your family, for example. So um, I was wondering if, as a performer, if you're often able to get to that space, and if there's a particular type of material, a comedy or a drama, that is, um, I don't know, for lack of a better term, transcend it, or that kind of gets you to that space? My goodness, Phil, you're asking the most profound questions. I really, uh, I really have to work to step up uh, and, and provide an answer. Um, at, at the time I met Peter Brook, I didn't have a self yet. I was on, I think I was always doing a bit. You know, I was always uh, projecting some kind of characterization because I didn't feel like I still, even though I had big feelings, was accepted in the theater as a player. You know, I was just a college kid as my college theater critic. And there was something about the way he gazed at me um, that I could not hide. You know, I, first of all, I had smoked some hash out of a hookah with some of the eclectic uh, bohemians who were passing a pipe around at this party I was lucky enough to get to. So I didn't have any artifice. I didn't have any energy for artifice. And when he looked at me that presently, a perfect stranger, I felt like I could be vulnerable and cry and he would see me and it would be okay. I felt like everything would be okay. And so I knew and identified and bookmarked where that place was. And could I get there alone without looking at Peter Brook? <laughs> you know? And um, I think in my life now, it's pretty much always available. But there was a murky time where I couldn't be truly present with other people. Um, and 
and it took a lot of practice in front of cameras, in front of um, stage audiences, and then just in intimate rooms with other people for me to get down to what I who I really was without apology, without fear of being struck. Um, so that presence is what I teach in my charismatizing improvising classes, how to find humor in presence alone. Um, you'll see it in wonderful actors, that kind of presence that, has, that comes between the lines. Um, you know, Jean Smart is showing her stuff right now. Uh, just the way she listens and reacts without speaking. Um, certainly Kate Winslet on Mayor of Easttown showed what her, her silences were profound. And I think until I met Peter Brook, I didn't even know that was possible for me. And I really yeah. recommend presence for everybody. Yeah, I, I once uh, had the experience, I appeared in a play and when, when I was in college and I, um, I didn't recall anything that I had done, um, but I knew that I had done a good job. And when I've read about some things about other actors, uh, I mean, famous actors and done this professionally, they've recalled similar experiences, um, I guess, because they've managed to put themselves totally in that play without thinking of anything else. And um, so that's that, that made me think of that when I read that chapter. You know, there, there's a, uh... There's moment. It's like a drug trip, isn't it? I mean, where you be, your presence because becomes so unified with the story or the character's presence that it's like all your daily baggage disappears. All your ticks and twitches and your self consciousness just vaporizes, and you are in another time, in another place, with people who are supposed to who are supposed to be other characters, and they really are. You really believe them, and uh, that's what we all strive for. That it's really, really happening. You know, mm -hmm. so good for you. You know what it's like. <laughs> um, you write about being a performer on the comedy show Fridays and um, having your sketches rejected in favor of those by, for example, Larry David and Michael Richards. Um, why do you think that was a problem for uh, many women writers during that time? And do you feel like when, during your time on Fridays um, or on other on other shows or other things that you've done that you were able to turn that around, that you were able to change people's um, perception of that? Well, there were two blockades on Fridays. Uh, one was that most of the writers had never worked with actors before, like Larry Charles, for example, who's gone on to enormous success, you know, directing the uh, Ali G, uh, you know, some of the Seinfelds, some of the Curbs. He was an 18 year old, hippie boy from Boston who'd never worked with actors and he's just had a gift for writing very black comic material. I mean, really edgy, like Diner of the Living Dead, which was uh, about a restaurant where we serve like a hand sandwich, you know, with a, a side of spleen. I mean, he had a bizarre, bizarre imagination. And so he wrote from what he knew, which was not writing to empower women or for funny women. He wrote mostly for men. We only had one woman writer on that show. Uh, she tried, but she couldn't get much of our stuff on, you know, she, each of the writers would work with some of the performers to develop their material. And I have to say Michael Richards and Mark Blankfield were so loud and physical that they got the most attention. Uh, Mary Edith and Brandis and I were more ladylike and, and demure and discreet. We weren't abrasive and violent. So our material wasn't going to be as attention getting as like Andy Kaufman or Michael Richards. Larry was a terrific writer. He wrote some very theatrical, interesting scenes. He wasn't violent. He was quite a gentleman, I have to say. Always a really sweet person. And um, nothing like the misanthropic character you see in Curb Your Enthusiasm now. He <laughs> yeah. really developed that persona and it's worked really well for him. But he was just kind of a nice guy, kind of a depressed guy. Um, so I have to say that Lauren Michaels, I have friends who are on Saturday Night Live. Lorraine Newman is a good friend of mine. Rosie Schuster and Ann Beats, the late Ann Beats, who just passed away a few mm -hmm. weeks ago, were mm -hmm. writers on Saturday Night Live. There was a whole different atmosphere. The men writers on that show, like Alan Swybell, really liked women and they loved their characters. And then someone like Gilda just had enormous pools of ideas for herself and the other women. So I have to say, I can't say all men were like this, repressive or didn't get women's comedy. Lorne Michaels and his staff did get it. 
Mm. And I think uh, the show still is a, an outgrowth of his imagination and his openness to the power of women. Did you try out for Saturday Night Live or? Funny you should yeah. ask. In 1975, Jane Curtin and I were in an off-Broadway improv musical called The Proposition, which came down from Cambridge and Boston. Brilliant, brilliant Harvard kids. Fred Grandy was in the show, Jane Curtin, a lot of other wonderful performers, Ray Baker, uh, Paul Kreppel. And um, I was in the cast of The Proposition with all, all of them. That was the first New York replacement into the show. And during that time, Jane and I were both asked to audition for Friday, for Saturday Night Live. And she got the kind of the part that I read for. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm supposed to do a show like this. Why didn't I get this? And then within a couple of years, I auditioned for Fridays and got a show, which was a, a kind of a, a parallel, almost an LA parallel to Saturday Night Live. And I got to do the news, which is what Jane Curtin was doing on the Saturday Night Live. So it was kind of synchronistic. Um, and Lorraine and I, uh, Lorraine and I, Lorraine lives right near me. I was at her daughter's bat mitzvah. Her daughter is on, you know, Hannah Einbinder is on the show Hacks now with Jean Smart. She's wonderful. Um, we talk a lot about what it was to be not written for. Lorraine and I both had that feeling of not being written for as much as other characters on the show. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't come in with the kind of characters that Michael Richards came in with. We didn't know we had to start writing before we got there, you know, and have things right in our pockets that we could pull out. Um, but anyway, that environment is still very supportive to women. I, I, I watch it from time to time. I think they're not always perfect, but boy, they come up with some just genius, brilliant stuff still. I should mention also, if you're not familiar with Melanie's work on the TV show Fridays, if you go to YouTube and you, you know, you type in Melanie's name and Fridays, you can see some very funny segments that she did for that, including her wonderful news anchor uh, segments. Uh, so, you know, before, uh, I mean, I, I didn't want, I was too young to watch Fridays when it was first run. Um, my brother, who is uh, nine years older than me, did watch the show and had told me about it. Um, but I got to go on and watch some of Melanie's work there. And it's very funny. Uh, and I should also mention, Melanie, that you more than hold your own against uh, Mark Blankfield and Michael Richards, who were big time scenery chewers. So, <laughs> good job. <laughs> Uh, what was wonderful on Fridays, too, was that I got to work with some of the most extraordinary talents in the world. I mean, Bonnie Raitt sang on the show, but Greg mm -hmm. Hines was on the show and danced, and we got to be buddies. And I got to, you know, and I was a Broadway baby, and I didn't know anything about rock and roll music, but we premiered, premiered The Clash, The Boomtown Rats, Oingo Boingo, uh, so many extraordinary groups. So I got a really fast rock and roll and garage band and grunge and punk musical education. Uh, back then. So it was like college for me. I just loved, loved the whole atmosphere. So you've done uh, a lot of um, voice acting, and I was wondering if you found it difficult making that transition to voice acting, and whether you prefer it. Um, is it freeing? Is it inhibiting? How do you feel about it? Well, um, my favorite space is still the theater, uh, full blown, full length, no stops. Um, but what a wonderful little side business voiceover was. In New York, I used to do, uh, whenever Elaine May wasn't available, which is most of the time, I would be the woman in the, uh, the, the scenes, like the comedy little review scenes for commercials. They used to have a lot of little scenes, and I would do Elaine May. Um, <laughs> and I did a lot of those sorts of scenes, the psychologist and the patient, you know, and now it's all spokesperson stuff. But back then it was really fun. You had really fun little acting scenes to do. So I've been doing some form of voiceover and I always did character voices and improvs. I always played, you know, the New York Jewess or I would uh, be the old lady, the shy little old lady. Or I would be the bratty little girl, you know. So improv gave me a lot of chance to flex my voice. And I think Rugrats was one of the first cartoons I ever auditioned for. I'm told that I played Wonder Woman on the cartoon Super Friends and that I was on uh, a show about Pac-Man. I don't remember it, but I'm told I was before Rugrats. But I just auditioned for Rugrats with a couple of other wonderful actors. We improvised some scenes. And then they called me on the phone from New York and asked me to audition for the part of the Yiddish grandmother, uh, Minka. And who knew what a 
cash cow this would become and what a triumph it would be. I'm very proud of having been part of it. The show only uh, did, we did a pilot a year, I, I'd forgotten about it. We came back a year later and they showed us a screening of it. And here was my mother's voice. I was using my mother's voice the whole time I did the show. My mother's voice coming out of this creature, you know, with red hair. And, and I fell in love with it. Like, oh, I, it's not my body. What a relief. You know, she'll do all the heavy lifting. <laughs> And after a couple of years of doing the show, we only did about seven or eight seasons, by the way. They'd bring us back every few years for specials or films or video games. Um, it began to look more like me. It began to use my facial expressions. The forehead was more like me. The mouth and the little mouth noises were more like mine. So it was uh, really trippy. I really loved being, being part of that voicing Didi over those years. It was a real privilege. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about your, um, I guess you would say, spiritual crisis uh, described in the book, um, specifically in regard to what you call the strength of belief that informed your, or informs your acting. Yeah, I was not brought up in a religious household. My parents were kind of humanists. You know, they liked uh, a lot of alternative faiths. Um, and I didn't have any religious training. So I saw the social benefits of being religious because there was, you know, Catholic school parties and there were Jewish dances. And so theater was how I found a, a place to play because I didn't really fit into any of those credos. And for me, um, theater was like a temple where everybody would believe in the same story for about a month or two. And then we'd leave that story and then I'd have to search for another story to be a part of. And when I wasn't part of another story, I didn't have any credo. I didn't really have a strong belief system or much faith. So around the time I did that Broadway show, which was so much like Spider-Man and all its repercussions, you know, the recent uh, inhumanity of Spider-Man to its, its staff and to its flying actors. Um, since theater treated us all so cruelly in that instance, I started to think I better look outside theater for a belief system. And I searched from pillar to post. Uh, a lot of people were going through spiritual crises at the time. I think I was having a nervous breakdown, but I called it a spiritual crisis because it was more kosher, you know, to have a spiritual crisis. And I was invited because I was a television celebrity to meet with some of the greater gurus, in, including Muktananda. Uh, who had taken over a, 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 a resort, a Jewish resort, and turned it into an ashram in the Catskills. Um, I have a story in there. Uh, oh, what's it called? You'll have to remind me. Oh, uh, my obscured third eye. Because I mm -hmm. thought, I don't have a third eye like other people. I just have a blank space here, and I can't, I don't have that vision that everybody has. Or if I do have it, it's very erratic. So I was given an audience with Muktananda, and like the girl in chorus line, I felt nothing, you know? Everybody was bowing and praying for me and I, I wasted the man's time. I just got no, nothing out of it at all except the desire to flee. But, um, you know, I think therapy became not a religion for me, but it showed me the way to believe in myself without a role to play, without a family to degrade me or contradict me, uh, without a husband, I never had a husband until very recently, actually, um, to shape myself to, to adapt myself to. So um, I was pretty lost until I was in my 50s, I'd say. And now I'm just growing up finally. I'm late, I'm a late bloomer. <laughs> um, you write about the experience of becoming famous. Um, did you find it overwhelming? Um, did you find it difficult to adjust to that level of attention? Well, you know, we were inured to it because when we were shooting Fridays, we were on a, a closed set. Uh, we had an audience, but they're very well controlled by security. So I never really interfaced with the public. We were too busy. We worked six hour, six days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day. And uh, so as Michael and I were beginning to get the most fan mail, we didn't really interface with audiences. They were kept off the lot. So the first time I really interfaced with audiences where they had access to me, aside from writing me fan mail, uh, I did a, a show, uh, the premiere of March of the Fal Falsettos in, in Los Angeles, their prominent theater. And I loved the music. It was, a, it was an opera. I don't know if you saw it, Phil. It was on Broadway. It's called Falsettos. No, I haven't seen it. 
Uh, well, it ran a few years ago. It's a very unusual show. It's an opera about a, a man that realizes he's, he's homosexual and his wife who realizes that he's been stooping his best friend all these years and I didn't really realize it. And his best friend is living with us and it's happening right under my roof. So I have a nervous breakdown. And um, so the, the show is very controversial. It was sold out all the time. And I started getting incredible fan mail from people who were coming to see the show. And on the opening night of the show, I got an enormous package that was making a lot of noise. And um, I'm gonna read you a passage from that, okay? Okay, yeah. This chapter is called Homing In. Mm -hmm. Telegrams and flowers were arriving for us when a large package with multicolored ribbons was delivered to me. Strange sounds were coming out of it. So we tore off the wrapping paper to reveal a large bird cage containing a live carrier pigeon, a wheel of Buddha, a bottle of Dom Perignon and a bag of bird seed. As our opening night show wrapped with standing ovation, we, we rushed, rushed upstairs to open the champagne and to read the note attached to the bird cage. I'm a big fan and a humble farmer. I own and operate my own ranch and brewery in North Texas. I'll be bold and tell you I'm looking for a wife to share my world. I'll be attending your matinee in eight weeks and if you'll consent to having dinner with me, put a yes on my prize pigeons leg band and set her free to come home to me. If you prefer not to meet, put a no on the leg band and I'll look forward either way to seeing you on stage. Respectfully, Dudley. <laughs> this was the most original attention getting fan mail ever. It beat out the red nightgown sent to me by the crew of the nuclear sub, the USS Bremerton that had been emblazoned with submariners, do it deeper on the front and all the novel proposals I was getting from prisoners but I was in no spirit for some, strange, for some stranger bribing me with livestock. We named the pigeon Midge and she became our show's good luck charm and my personal sedative amid the trappings of fame and showbiz. I would take her home to my apartment for her vacations on my Mondays off and we all would feed and pet her before the show each night. I loved having her company, having like a farm animal in you know my theatrical life just felt grounding and real. Kind of like being with Peter Brook, same kind of thing. <laughs> but after six weeks, I knew I was going to say no by bird to Dudley. So I wrote on the little note, I put it on the ring of her little leg. I kissed her bouncy little head and I leaned out the window and tossed her up hard over into the sky over the theater's park, parking lot. She was so much bigger with her wings spread. Valiantly, she flapped hard, getting some ballast on the wind. And then, and then she seemed not to be able to soar aloft. After struggling in midair for what seemed an eternity, Midge simply stopped trying. And then she dropped, she gathered speed and she plummeted like a stone, pelting a Cadillac hood. Soon a broken heap of her plumage was all that remained of our Midge. So I had to call Dudley. I'm horribly sorry, I said. She was a wonderful, wonderful bird and everybody here loved her. Irreplaceable, he said. I'm sure, I said. So, what was your answer, Dudley, Dudley asked? Were you having supper with me? It was, yes, I lied. But let me treat you to supper that matinee day. It's matinee day, it's the least I can do. Okay, he said, appeased. The day arrived and ruddy-faced Dudley came to the stage door in a three-piece suit. I knew he would not be handsome as desirable men rarely work that hard at courtship. As we wordlessly chewed a couple of loud cob salads at the Brown Derby, it was beyond awkward. And I was glutted with every possible nuance of despondency and loneliness. Having so fatally scrambled my midge's homing instincts, I wondered if I'd ever come home to myself. Well, it's a black comic, sad story. Um, but uh, anyway, that was what it was like when fans wanted to date me. It was very <laughs> awkward and I didn't want everybody to think I was stuck up and conceited. And I mean, there was a lawyer that started showing up at my apartment, got my address from the DMV, bringing me flowers and I had to have him, threaten to have him disbarred to get him to leave me alone. Oh, wow. He was telling everybody what, what a bitch I was and that I let him on. I was like, what? You know, people get strange fixations when you look into the lens. People think they really know you. They don't really know me. I'm just looking into the lens. 
I'm, I'm curious about the, the reaction to this book from um, your family and friends, particularly people who, you know, you write about in the book. Uh, because this book gets so personal, um, what kind of reactions have you gotten um, from people? Well, um, some of the people depicted in the book uh, are friends. Um, I am not, I, I, I don't have much family. Only my sister and my mom are, remain. Um, my sister uh, really didn't like it. And she comes off very well in the book. I think she comes off better than I do. Uh, but she sort of wrote me an e-bomb asking me to cease and desist ever writing about our family again. And I sent my mother a edited book. I told her she would not enjoy the whole book. I was only going to send her a book missing five chapters that might offend her. And she loves the writing, but she, at a certain point, she said to me, your father didn't throw me out in the snow naked. I had clothes on that time. It was another time uh, that you're thinking of. And I, I said, well, is that it, mom? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I remember it differently. But at a certain point, she said she was going to stop reading it because reading about my father and stuff kind of upset her. My father, may he rest in peace, um, has long been gone. But I think every, every memoirist risks this of uh, offending their parents. I think it's just part of the burden we bear. And uh, I'm sorry, on behalf of all memoirists, I'm sorry if you were hurt. This is just our skew on you. It's not actually the way you would see it. I'm sure you have your own Rashomon and you should write your own book. Um, so when, you know, the, like I said before, these were a lot of the material was originally in articles or essays. Um, so when you decided to expand them into a book or change them, um, what kind of changes did you may, make? What, what are some examples? Well, I've been writing these stories for years and performing them at like uh, Comedy Central has a stage here in Hollywood. I was performing them there for live audiences and I was commissioned by the Joshua Tree Comedy Festival to do a one woman musical. So I created a musical for them called Odd Woman Out. And then an agent, a uh, literary agent saw me perform and she said, well, this is a book. It's very important that you write this as a book because only a few people will see it in the theater, but in the, in the book, it will be available to the world. And so she kind of mentored me and I put it in book form. And when I met my husband and we fell in love, it seemed like, well, wow, now I've got a happy ending. You know, it had a happy ending because I was happy with myself. You know, at a certain point in my 60s, I felt pretty great about myself uh, as a person, not just for my, my, my resume. And um, then I thought, well, now I've got a whole ending. And um, I, I think that's what made me think this was a book worth writing because when I would tell young men, women that I was getting married for the first time at 65, they would say, oh, you give me hope. And I thought, and then I had gay men say that to me too. Oh, you give me hope that I'll find my one. So that made it even more of a motivation to, to complete the book, to show people, as long as you keep working on yourself, there is an opportunity for you to fall in love with yourself. And then maybe if you're lucky and they're lucky, somebody else too. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I right now I'd like to, uh, we're at 745. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question or you can write it in the chat. Um, I did notice a little bit farther back, there was a question from Deb. She was asking what it was like working with Tony Randall. Melanie? Oh, well, he's a consummate pro. Very lovely gentleman. I work with him on the on the Merv Griffin show as well as being on his series with Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton and I were in Tony Randall, who played a law professor's law class. I was a stewardess trying to examine my rights um, as a stewardess. Um, Tony was a professional. He was very reserved, uh, very cool, and he had a very sardonic sense of humor. He'd suddenly come out with a, a comment you know, about what was going on. Um, and he kept himself apart, you know, he didn't hang out with everyone like Bob Newhart did. Bob Newhart liked to hang out with everyone and work on material using all of us. Um, yeah. But yeah, he was fine. I mean, it was very long ago. I was in my 20s, so I don't have any more details than that. Um, any other questions? Oh, uh, Wally asked, what project are you currently working on? 
Oh, wow. Well, right now the pandemic is kind of in and out of our lives. But you know, the, the production starts to step up and it steps down. I just signed with a talent manager, uh, had Lane Fallow for the last seven or eight years and only done things I was offered. But I decided I want to start auditioning again. So I'm reading for something pretty wonderful on Thursday. Uh, so I'm just starting to get my foot back in there as an older woman now, as the mother of Patricia Arquette in this one proposed series. Um, so I'm between, between careers. And I, and I have a number of pieces that are being published right now, one in Chicken Soup for the Soul, my fourth edition, um, on, a, on a, a magazine called Goat's Milk that was just published there on a... On, an, on, a, on Medium. Do you know what Medium is? Oh, we get it here. It's a very topical daily news uh, paper online, and I just uh, sold something there. So I, I'm still writing, and now I'm going to try some acting again at this age. Okay. Hi, I'd like to ask something. I'm so interested in you. My name is Deborah, and um, I studied some acting at Barnard. My acting partner was Cynthia Nixon. So I would, it, you know, it's ironic. I'm still living in the Bronx in a very Jewish Italian neighborhood. You can tell by my accent. Oh, yeah, and she's, you know, we all know she turned, yeah, she turned out to be so successful. So I appreciate um, your bravery for writing your memoirs and um, sharing all of your anecdotes with us and expressing yourself. It was really, really wonderful to um, have the privilege to hear you speak, and you're very beautiful and bold. Wow! Yeah. I'm also friends with Chaz Palminteri. I've, I've, I've hung out with him just because of a mutual friend of ours. Um, unfortunately, one of his best friends died of COVID at the beginning of COVID, oh. um, and he was a well-known politician here in the Bronx named Phil Folia. So that was how I got to meet Chaz and go to functions with them. So um, thank you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, you can get my book in the libraries. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, we do have copies available through the Yonkers Public Library. So. Would you um, speak in your own audio book? Sorry, I can't hear. Would you ever do like an audio book? Oh, and would out. you be it's the out. one voicing it? It's out? Oh, it's on Audible and I do all the voices. I do my mom, my dad, various sleazy agents. I do Rodney Dangerfield in it actually. and. Just a lot of wonderful characters that I met. So yeah, it's on Audible, um, which is, and it's free if you are a subscriber to Audible. And if not, you just go on Amazon, go to one click, push the button, and it's like 15 bucks, I think. That is so cool. I'm going to make a comment, but don't get freaked out. Earlier, you mentioned one of your, um, one of your fans is kind of like a stalker from all Elite, the lawyer? Yeah. Um, but I can see from all of the great stuff you gave us, is someone playing music? Um, but I can see from all the great stories that you gave with us today, I became more intrigued just by the extra roles and, and Phil um, enlightening us with the Friday, your earlier works. So I can see why the person could have possibly became one of the stalkers. As you see, even Deb thinks they're beautiful. I, I'm just intrigued mentally, so I can see where everywhere else. This is 10, 10, 10 all across the board. I had a great time. Well, thank you for telling me you understand stalkers. That's, that's really hard for me. Nobody's ever said that to me before. I had no idea. I had that kind of appeal, but thank you. You got to hear the compliment in it because I'm pretty sure at the end of the day, he just used to really intrigue the way we all are. Oh, you're nice. You satisfy our nerd side. This is great. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, oh, Marianne has her hand up. Marianne. What did you want to uh, Thank you so much for putting this together. And Melanie, it's such a pleasure to, to hear your adventures. I'm the biggest Tony Randall fan ever. And I remember these episodes that you're talking about because I saw you in them. I am that old as an audience member. 
Wow. I'm currently teaching for a nonprofit in the Bronx. And um, <clears throat> I am a theater teacher as well as a film and television teacher. One, one question I have for you. I'm, I'm coaching an actress with tremendous promise. She's transitioning from Broadway to film. So she's her growth has been tremendous. I sent her out to T. Schreiber to take classes. I was like, you, you need T. Schreiber Studios or something along those lines. It's all well. And, my job as a coach to get you is to get you to the next coach, right? What do you do when they're not necessarily taking direction when they're being coached for a film audition. So she's submitting at this point, but the pacing is a little slow. Um, okay, and the camera pacing. angles aren't perfect. How do I get her, I how do sure I get I her to buy answer. in? Um, can I ask, um, you mean her personal pacing is slow? Her actress pacing is slow. Her personal pacing is a little slow too, but the act, Talk about those pauses. Too long. Well, I, you know, I, I can only spitball because I don't know the talent and stuff. But I would right. always say that improv will get her pace stepped up. Okay. The, the speed of improvisation uh, depends on the okay. personnel involved, but she'll have to be faster on her feet to interface. Right. It sounds like she's judging herself or assessing the direction before she takes action. And if she gets into an improv class, she could let go of that. There are improv classes ah, online okay. with the ground lanes. Thank you. That's very, okay, that's very good advice. Thank you. Because okay. I want to help her, but sometimes hearing it from a different person is a good thing. You yeah, know? Improv, improv, I've used improv in everything I have ever done because they may give you the lines to say, but the behavior is completely improvisational, completely individual. And that's how you make it. Oh, improv. thank you. Very much appreciate that. Thank you so much for everything. Okay. Continued best luck in your endeavors, and hopefully we'll get to see you doing your thing live, right? Who was your favorite colleague or co-worker to have worked with? One woman and one man, or one day, because you know we're in 2021. <laughs> oh, boy, I've been around a long time, and I've worked with really extraordinary people. Uh, the, the most recent, I'm very fickle. The most recent one always replaces the last one, you know. Um, if you're talking about not big names, I loved working with Raul. He was very spontaneous and vulnerable and respectful uh, and a total professional. And that was a very long time ago. Uh, very courteous, very, just very, he had great professional deportment, always on time, always knew his lines. Um, in terms of women, there's so many women I'd love to get to share the light with. Like Diana Wiest is one of my idols. Oh, yeah. She's just fantastic. I'm trying to get her for a, a screenplay I've written about an older woman uh, who escapes her husband and falls in love with somebody in her 60s. Um, based on elements in my book, but not based on anyone I know. And let's see, what other women have I worked with? Well, Betty Buckley is a dear friend of mine for many, many years, a wonderful Broadway player, terrific television actress, and a dear friend. I loved a few times I got to work with her. <clears throat> she studied improv with me, actually. We got to do a lot of scenes together. And I studied uh, song interpretation with her. And um, I, 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 she's one of my favorites and always will be. Uh, Chris, did you have a question? You had your hand raised. So, yes, in, in advice to, to uh, the, the very young, actually. My, my cousin's daughter is a community theater child star, pretty much up on top of the. Oh, he froze. But, Can he write in the chat? And she was at the center. Chris, you're, we're losing you because of your signal. Can you write your question in the chat box? Okay. okay. Um, Still can't hear me? Can hear you now. I'm good now? Yep. Okay, yeah. And actually, in this part of Eastern Long Island, there are actually no school plays up to sixth grade. So th this, this young girl was doing getting leads in, in community theater there. And she 
her parents were not actors. Her dad's a fireman, mom works for the Oxygen Network. And I, I, I had the privilege of being invited out because I'm the, the only other actor in the family. And, uh, but do you think the best route for a young actress like that would be to try to get some training in New York or just continue with the local community theater circuit or what would be the best route for her to go? Well, you know, I don't know the teachers now, Chris. I wish I could advise, I'm, I'm old school. Um, I would say she should listen to a lot of uh, famous actors speaking. There's a lot of master classes right now, just to you know, you know immerse herself in the wisdom of uh, experienced actors. Uh, mm -hmm. If the community theater isn't damaging for her, I think that would be great. I'm not sure if they're going to be having live classes in New York right now. I really don't know the intensity, but there's no reason why she can't keep learning and growing. Mm -hmm. uh, I work with people privately online on Zoom. It's got a certain value. I'm not in the room, but I am very observant. I'm finding I pick up a lot through the screen. I work with actors all over the country. I work with actors in China and Australia. So if you wanted to uh, get my information from Phil and write to me, uh, I could maybe discuss whether my work would be suitable. Okay. okay. Bruce, you had your hand up. Yes, my name is Bruce Yeko. I saw Via Galactica in the first oh. preview. <laughs> Nothing happened in that. I produced In Trousers for CD, William Finn's trilogy, the first one that led to falsettos. Oh. And I also, wow. I also produced Love Zone. I'd like to talk to you about Love Zone, Michael Valenti. Oh, yes, musical. I did that off-Broadway. I did it at the... But it, closed, it closed opening night, but was it still a good experience? Oh, it's wonderful. The only problem was it was an Agba contract, which is American Guild of Variety Artists, a nightclub contract. And we all had to join that union uh, to be part of the show off-Broadway because it was a nightclub. And then our, you know, our salaries were hardly enough to cover the, the purchase of the union thing, but the producer, Wayne, whatever his name was, was going to pay us all back and then as soon as the show closed he disappeared so we were all stuck having laid out a couple hundred dollars to join a union that doesn't even exist anymore but i loved working with michael i loved my songs i had great songs and we actually did an album which i still have so that that's what i produced i oh. paid, oh. paid for the recording uh, you know i don't sorry i don't remember bruce but i'm sure you did it was a beautiful <laughs> album and I think I only sang a couple songs on it. Michael now wants to record the complete score. He should. Wow. He really he, should. He has been very successful in many kinds of music. So that's good that he, you know, his theater things have not succeeded, but he's done band and orchestral. And uh, so they are always good oh, things. Very talented. Any more but questions? I would like to Zoom with you talking about your theater career. I uh, spoke and Phil uh, would be Thank in touch you. with you. Great. Well, I'm kind of busy trying to be an actor and a writer right well, now. It can but... be done anytime, anytime, whenever you're okay. available. Thank you. Would you ever do another voiceover cartoon? Oh, well, why wouldn't I? Of course. It's wonderful work. You know, you don't have to uh, go to a studio. You can do it from home now. Um, you don't have to wear makeup or high heels or underwear. I mean, it, it can be very easily done. And um, and if the writing is good, I'm very happy. Uh, Rugrats was very well written. I was very I put my kids to sleep with that show. So I, I liked you in it. Did you do the movie as well? I did several movies. I did uh, Rugrats in Paris, Rugrats Go Wild. The first Rugrats, the movie, where I gave birth to Dill, the newest baby of the Rugrats. Thank you, Melanie. This was awesome. You're, you're so talented on very different areas. I, I mean, even the knowledge that you brought up out of everybody in the group, I love it all. Thank you, thank you. We thank will be you. picking up your book and the audio book. Oh, tell, tell uh, Phil that you're going to put my book on hold and tell everybody to read it. Yes. Yep. It's again, it's called Odd Woman Out by Melanie Chertoff. And thank you again, Melanie, for doing this program with us. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending. So stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Namaste.